Well, hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin, this is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you're here today. Today, we have a really exciting interview in store for you today. Today, I just finished interviewing Father Peter Hears, and I think you're going to love it. It is a deep dive for sure, so you're going to want to grab a pen, paper, get your notes out, however you like to do that, and, and feel free to pause the video as you go because it is somewhat like drinking water from a fire hydrant. He is full of information. I found it so helpful and a lot of new things that I hadn't come across about orthodoxy. And so I hope you'll enjoy it as well. Real quick, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon subscribers and merch buyers who make this channel possible, especially to my monthly patrons. You guys mean the world to me. It, it, your support really helps this channel not only be sustainable, but to continue to grow and further the mission of gospel simplicity, which is to introduce people to the beautiful simplicity and transformative power of the gospel. If you're interested in becoming a patron and supporting this show, you can do so down below using the link to Patreon, and that would mean so much to me. In any case, I want to let you guys get to this interview. I hope you enjoy it. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Today, I am joined by Father Peter Hears. Father Peter Hears was born in Dallas, Texas and grew up near San Francisco. He's the son of an Anglican priest, and in 1992, his parents and much of his father's parish converted to the Orthodox Church. In 1996, he came to Thessaloniki, Greece, in order to visit Mount Athos, returning again in 1998 to begin the theological school of the University of Thessaloniki. He lived in Thessaloniki for 18 years, where he was married to a Thessaloniki native and blessed with five children, and ordained the diaconate and priesthood in 2003 in the Diocese of Castoria. He is the editor of the Orthodox Ethos and has a YouTube channel under the same name. Father Peter is the founder and current head of Uncut Mountain Press and the founder and first editor of Divine Ascent, a journal of Orthodox faith. Father Peter is also the author of several books, including the Ecclesiological Res Oh, ecclesiological renovation of the Second Vatican Council, an orthodox examination of Rome's ecumenical theology regarding baptism. He's also the translator of several books, including a best-selling children's book, From Iville to Uville. Father Peter has undergraduate, master's, and doctoral degrees in dogmatic theology from the Theological School of the University of Thessaloniki. Father Peter, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's a joy. I've been enjoying uh, some of your podcasts I've been able to see, so... It was a joy to come on. Well, I've been really excited to have you on today. And from your bio alone, I think people can tell that you are a busy man that has done very much. So I was very excited that you'd take the time to do this and to talk about these really important topics. Today, we're going to be talking about foundational issues like scripture, tradition, councils, and authority. We're really going to be getting in the weeds, but I think it's going to be helpful for people. But I wanted to start with just, a, a you know, people heard a bit about your background, but how did you end up as an Orthodox priest? Well, I came initially to uh, to Greece uh, to visit Mount Athos. And if I don't know if you're familiar with Mount Athos, but it's a 1,000-year-old uh, monastic republic. It's kind of, I would consider it the center of Orthodoxy, spiritually speaking. And in terms of spiritual authority, it certainly has produced so many saints, even in our own day. So I, I made a pilgrimage to Mount Athos in northern Greece and uh, spent... Uh, a few months, uh, and was baptized in 1996 on Mount Athos. Uh, about a couple of years after my father and his parish became Orthodox in California. So when I returned to America, I was involved in publishing everything, but I really couldn't get out of my system, Athos, and I wanted to return. I returned with the intention of becoming a monk, uh, but it was God's providence that I go to theological school, and I, I as, as you said, I was married and started the, started the uh, theological school. So, it was, it was a desire for me to be in the church, whether it be a monastic or be a, a monk, a, a priest, that was up to God. And it was decided by uh, God's providence and, and uh, the spiritual father that that was the best, that I'd be a priest in the church. And so I was ordained and um, uh, stayed in Greece uh, for about 20 years uh, and, and then back in Greece now again after a couple of years in America. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the desire to serve the church. And it was the church said, you should be a priest. Yeah. Well, that, that's fantastic. And that's, that's a great way of coming about uh, priesthood. And, and so th thanks for sharing that. 
So, like I mentioned, we're, we're going to be talking about some, some fairly big topics here because I've really enjoyed your work and I've enjoyed the, the clarity that you bring to these topics. And I thought people would really benefit from hearing your perspective on these kind of foundational issues. And so, a, as a good evangelical, I thought we'd start with scripture. And so, if, if we could start kind of by defining terms, when, when you speak of scripture, what are you referring to and, and how do we know what scripture is and, and what it isn't? So these are weighty topics, and I want to I want to make sure I talk with precision. But uh, it's going to take some uh, introduction, and I want to give you a perspective that you probably have not heard, because there's a lot of orthodox um, attempts online to communicate the orthodox position. Sometimes they're not so successful. Sometimes they sound just a little bit different than what you've already heard in among Roman Catholics or Protestants, but I don't necessarily think they always represent the core of Orthodox tradition. And so I'm going to try to attempt to communicate that, but there's a lot there. And so I, hopefully this will be uh, beneficial for everybody, but obviously just on a basic factual level, the scriptures are the old and the new Testament uh, as accepted by the church determined by the Holy fathers in uh, the first 300 years, really not until the fourth century do we have a canon which the church says this is the accepted, uh, agreed to uh, uh, authoritative uh, scriptures for the New Testament. And the Old Testament had been largely determined already, uh, but also the church in the first few centuries determined what the, what the total canon would be. Uh, so that's not so interesting or so important. What's important is the rest of the story in terms of the New Testament. I think that we need to remember that the apostles never attempted to collect their text into a canon. Uh, St. Paul would have been very surprised at, had he learned and been alive that they had taken his epistles that he wrote to these churches and, and considered them Holy Scripture, because Holy Scripture was the Old Testament. The Old Testament is what's referred to in Scripture as Holy Scripture. Uh, so why did the church collect the text and make it a canon? Well, it was because of the, of the challenge and the distortion of the various heresies in the ancient church. So it, it didn't, the New Testament didn't exist for hundreds of years as we know it. And the, the pastoral need to protect the, the deposit and not have heretical texts creep in and be accepted as authoritative pro, uh, provoked the church to say, here are the boundaries and this is what the church is going to do again and again throughout history in the Holy Councils. We're going to talk about the councils later, but the church is going to do that. And, and those boundaries are going to be uh, asserted again and again and again through, throughout church history, precisely for the sake of the salvation of the world and of the faithful, so that outside those boundaries, people do not go, because outside those boundaries, salvation is not going to be obtainable. So, but... To properly understand the place of Scripture in the Orthodox Church, you have to understand first the parakatathiki, or the deposit of the faith, or the heritage. There's different translations for the term used by the Apostle Paul. It basically means that which was committed to your trust. He's talking to Timothy. So the parakatathiki, uh, which is uh, the manifestation of the uncreated grace and the uncreated energy of God. Only God is uncreated, obviously, right? So every God creates, he himself is uncreated. The grace of God is uncreated in the Orthodox Church. We don't believe in created grace. We consider that to be a heresy and a, and, and a distortion of the understanding in the scriptures. So this is the manifestation of the uncreated grace and the energy of God and of the hypostatic union in Christ of God and man uh, in the incarnation. And this, all of this is the work of the infallible Holy Spirit. Uh, who illumines the prophets, the apostles, the fathers, the saints, to guide the faithful, to observe Christ's commandments, and to participate in his glory, which is salvation. The deposit, we have to understand the deposit so we can understand properly the place of Scripture and of holy tradition. Uh, so the deposit, or the paratakatathiki, existed long before Scripture. It existed from the creation of the world. It it was revealed not only to the apostles, but also to the prophets. Uh, for it's the bringing about, in a word, of the point of it is to bring about the purification, illumination, and glorification, or theosis, of the faithful. 
what Saint Ap the Apostle or the uh, the great uh, uh, Bishop of, uh, of of Alexandria, Athanasius says: God became man that man might become God. Theosis. That's the point of the incarnation. That all human beings participate in the divine energy, or as the Apostle Peter says, are partakers of the divine nature. So that's the that's the point and the aim and the the purpose of the uh, the passing on uh, of holy tradition and holy scripture is a part of that so the heritage or the deposit of holy or or holy tradition is not different from holy scripture but it's included in holy scripture when holy scripture is read and interpreted by the church that's a presupposition there are a lot of presuppositions that we need to have in mind when we talk about these issues they're pres they're presumed they're accept they're 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 um, understood to be there without them being enumerated many times in uh, the scriptures or in church history so the deposit again is is a um, it's a gift of the holy spirit essentially which has presuppositions so we have a giver who is god we have the gift which is the participation in the divine energies of God, salvation, and we have the recipients who are the apostles, the prophets, the saints of the church. And, and we could also say, and it would be very correct, to say that the deposit or the parakatathiki is Christ himself. He's all in all in the church. He's what's passed on from generation to generation. He actually passes himself on from generation to generation to each coming down. And that happens in the church through ordination, but also through the stages of perfection. In other words, those people who are passing it on are passing through the stages of perfection, purification, illumination, and glorification. These are the, the patristic uh, categories of the life in Christ. And those are, those are essential to understand those. Uh, you to understand what we're talking about, you have to understand that that's the heart of salvation, that we go through those stages and reaching uh, theosis, which is the aim of our life in Christ. So it's Christ himself who passes on. He is the one who passes on tradition through the apostles to the fathers and through uh, the fathers of every age, the saints of every age. It's he himself that also gives and is given in all the mysteries. So in baptism, in the Eucharist, in chrismation, in ordination, he's the one performing the mysteries. He's giving himself in the mystery. And uh, and all of that is happening in himself, which is the church. So it's in God, by God, and for God. And what St. Paul says, God, Christ, is all in all in his body. So all who fall away from this parakatathiki, this deposit, this tradition, this, uh, th this uh, life, they fall away from Christ. They fall away. Uh, it's one, it's synonymous with falling away from Christ. Uh, so another, another thing we could say here in presupposition understanding the place of Holy Scripture is that the heritage or the deposit of faith is the revelation of God throughout the ages to the apostles, to the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, it's the logos, whether he be pre-incarnate or in the incarnation, it's the logos who is imparting this to his friends, his apostles or prophets or fathers. And so it's this, uh, this revelation of God is recorded in Holy Scripture, but it's not the revelation of God. Scripture is not the revelation of God, but the recording or a word about the revelation of God. And this is a really, really important point because I think this is a diversion for some in the West from the patristic tradition from from our perspective, uh, where they they go beyond that and they they identify the word in Holy Scripture with the Logos Himself, and these two are different uh, because He's beyond words. He's uncreated. His experience is beyond the created words that we express. Uh, although He's witness to, and the Scripture is 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 extremely important for us to enter into that communion with God in the Church. Uh, so, and we believe as Orthodox that all scripture is divinely inspired. But the reason why we believe that is because we believe, we know and we believe 
that those who have recorded scripture and given a scripture were uh, had the experience of the divine. So divinely inspired because they had the experience of the divine, they were illumined and glorified in the church and in, in the grace of God in the Old Testament. So it's clear in church tradition and church history and the lives of the saints that divine inspiration is regarded as a natural condition for Christians. It's not something that should be uh, added on, uh, but that's, that's how Christians live by divine inspiration if they've been purified, if they are in a state of illumination. In other words, if they're going through the therapeutic program of the church and they're being saved, they're added to the church, as it says in the, apostle, in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, through the mysteries, and then they remain in that, in that grace, and they're being saved throughout their life, and they're not falling away from that salvation. So it is a, uh, this, this condition is a presupposition for all those who venture to interpret Holy Scripture. So anybody who's going to be a communicant or a participant in the, in the divine nature, according to what the Apostle Paul says, he says, or Peter says, he says, uh, according to his divine power, he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory. This is a uh, a reference to the glorification or, or, or deification or theosis, the, the becoming, uh, participating in divine grace. Uh, and uh, whereby are given, he says, unto us exceeding and great precious promises. What's the great promise that's been given to us? That we might be partakers of the divine nature. Uh, and, and how does that happen? Well, he goes on and says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So it's a presupposition that you have escaped the corruption in the world before you can partake of divine grace, the nature, divine energies uh, of God. And therefore, there are presuppositions. It's not something that you can obtain simply by force of will. Uh, so the, the, and then this is very important in terms of Holy Scripture. The context of Holy Scripture, uh, and so... Therefore, the presupposition of understanding and applying it in our lives is the whole life in Christ. And the term for that wholeness is Catholicity, the Catholic. That's a Greek term for katholo, all of the life. We don't cut up into pieces. We can't take parts of it away and still have it. Uh, Christ is full and only full. We can't have a part of Christ. We can't, we can't, when we participate in the mysteries, it's all of Christ. It's all of uh, the church as a whole has to be maintained, retained, experienced. And that's a, whole, that's a presupposition for entering into the scriptures. Uh, that's the context of the Holy Scripture. In the Orthodox Church, the scriptures sit on the altar in the middle of the temple. And that's exactly where they have to be interpreted, in the middle of the temple, in the middle of the divine worship. And the presuppositions for participation in the divine worship are purification and the preparation and participation in the holy mysteries, uh, which means an ascetic life. So there's, there's a lot of things that are assumed when you approach Holy Scripture. It's not just a book that came down from heaven. We're not like, we don't believe like the Muslims or the, the Quran is something that it itself is a uncreated thing. That's what they believe. They believe it's God brought it to the to the uh, to the earth uh, as a whole and just re and just gave it to them it's a divine uh revelation per se the, the actual words themselves uh but in fact scripture exists and under is understood in the context of the church and so all this together councils the scripture the fathers are the symbols or the monuments of the faith and they're taken as a whole, though. They're, they're inseparable from one from another to be properly understood. And then finally, the one thing we need to do, or actually not finally, there's one or two other points I want to make about this, which is very important. Uh, the aim or the purpose of Holy Scripture. Why? Why has God allowed and given us Holy Scripture? You know, there was a time when there wasn't the Holy Scriptures, right? There was a time, at least for the, especially for the New Testament, when there was no Holy Scripture as we understand it today. Well, it's been given to lead men to the experience of Pentecost. 
In other words, to illumination and glorification, to an experiential knowledge of God. Epignosis is the Greek term. And that doesn't mean theoretical knowledge. It means experiential, hands-on knowledge. So when St. Paul talks about knowledge, he's talking about experiential knowledge. He's talking about an experience that then we can speak from experience. Like the Apostle John says, we saw, we touched, we felt. That is the experience of the church, and that's presupposed uh, here when we talk about knowledge of God. That's, that's experiential knowledge. Uh, the aim of the language of Holy Scripture is always understood in the context of leading men, people, through the stages of uh, perfection, purification, illumination, glorification. We see in the Acts of the Apostles that salvation to be saved, it's necessary to be added to the church in Acts 2, 7, 47 or 5, 13 to 14, that that was how people came to be saved. They were added to the church. So if someone were to, to memorize the entire scripture but didn't enter into the life of the church, it would be in vain. It would be pointless. Uh, to know every scripture by heart is not going to add up to a life in Christ. No less than St. John Chrysostom begins his interpretation of the Gospel of Matthew by saying that it would be very good if we didn't have need of Scripture. Scripture, in fact, the written word, the Lord himself never wrote anything. He didn't. He wasn't a prophet like the other religions who wanted to write down what his, his teachings. He never wrote anything except in the sand uh, to uh, save the, uh, uh, the woman caught in adultery. And the fathers say that what he wrote there was the sins of those who were about to stone her. So that's, that's all we have in Scripture in terms of him writing down anything. And the apostle, the uh, St. John Chrysostom says, it would be good if we didn't have any need of these scriptures. That in other words, we have a, a, such a pure life that the grace of the Spirit should be instead of books to our souls. And he says that these are inscribed with ink, so should our hearts be with the Holy Spirit. In former times, God discouraged, discoursed rather, with his people, talked to his people, not by writings, but himself by himself finding their mind pure with Moses and the prophets. And to the apostles, he didn't give anything, as we said. He didn't write anything. But instead of written words, he promised what? To give them the grace of the Spirit. So Holy Scripture came about when people started to turn away from this life, corrupt the life. And it was written down as a way to preserve the parakatathiki, and to make sure that it was communicated along with the oral tradition, the written uh, scriptures. And it's in the same context of that deposit of faith that's come down to us. Both of them are inseparable. So you can have a life in the spirit apart from Holy Scripture. Uh, it's only one of the aids to life in Christ. It's given, of course, that the soul is nourished by the divine spirit uh, in the mystery of the life in Christ and the church. And so it's a wonderful, blessed thing. And we have it in every Orthodox church, as I said, on the altar. We read from it constantly. And all of our divine liturgies and divine services are made up of quotes and passages and pieces from Holy Scripture. So having said that, and quoting St. John Chrysostom, not in the least do we presume to be on the level of the great prophets and say that we don't need that. There are those who do reach that. And we'll talk about that. We can talk about that. There are those many of our saints who've reached the point where the scriptures are no longer necessary. Uh, they, they've, they've, they've invested and ingested them. They've lived them. They've incarnated them, as it were. And they live now in face-to-face in, in -face, uh, constant communion with God. Uh, but for the rest of us, the vast majority of us, we have great, great need of the Holy Scriptures for us to enter in. The, again, the aim of Holy Scriptures is for us to enter into that life in, in Christ, and so the uh, scriptures are a great gift from God for that purpose. So that, that's a, a very uh, rushed introduction to what's, and pieces here and there from what the Orthodox would say, uh, 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 say about ortho, uh, Holy Scripture. Well, thank you for that. And that was fantastic. And I love the way that it was very integrated with the whole of the Christian life, that it's not just a doctrine of scripture, but it ties into a doctrine of theosis. And ultimately, there seemed to be a real 
Christocentricity to it in that, you know, we see Jesus as the, the source of the scriptures, the, the substance of it and all of the mysteries of the faith. But ultimately he, it, it's more the, he is more than just scripture. So it's not like we're going to uh, equate the word of God, Jesus, the Logos with the, the words written on the page. And, and there was a lot there. And if I mischaracterized any of that, Oh, that's that. great. Yeah, yeah. And it's so important that we understand that, we, that the spiritual life is beyond rational. It's supra rational. It's not irrational. Mm -hmm. It's supra rational. It means it's, it's, it's the rational intellect is not the organ by which human beings are given to commune with God, but it's given to us, the rational intellect is given for us to understand and mainly for this life to make our way through this life. But communion exists uh, in a immediate communion and 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 face to face love and 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 exchange with the person of Christ himself so that that you you can see that in the life of of people in a family you know you don't love with your rational intellect you love with your heart you love with your your whole person and so the same is the is the case in in terms of entering into the communion of the church that's how we're going to commune with god and so it has to be beyond the words alone which is uh, are created. We have to enter the, into the uncreated uh, to commune with God. Yes, thank you. And so you talked a bit about how scripture is part of tradition, but it is not exhaustive of tradition and that it is not something necessarily to be pegged against tradition, which I think as an evangelical is maybe a kind of a, a point in which perhaps evangelicals and Orthodox talk past each other or just have disagreement as well. But there's this sense in which, for me, it's commonplace growing up to talk about a scripture versus tradition. But is that dichotomy something a, a bit foreign to orthodoxy, would you say? Yeah, let's talk about tradition first, and then I can answer the whole question of the, the relationship or the is there, is there an opposition. Um, I don't know if we need to say this, but it's very clear in the Apostle Paul, for instance, there's many re references to tradition. Uh, so the tradition is there in first, Second Thessalonians. It's there in First Corinthians. Uh, he's talking very clearly about the tradition being the truth that he himself knew experientially, the revelation that he received, and the gospel itself, uh, and it's being imparted uh, in both word and and in in in, in writings by his epistles. Um, so divine revelation, the gospel, holy tradition—they're really synonymous. Uh, they, 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 the apostolic preaching and the life of the Holy Spirit in the church are inseparable. And in his epistles, we see him imparting holy tradition with regard, very importantly, to the divine Eucharist. And you could say that the divine Eucharist, the, 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 the uh, Holy Communion, is uh, together with the vision and the experience of the resurrected Christ, it's really the divine, defining characteristic of holy tradition. So we see that, for instance, he's passing on, which is tradition. That was what tradition means, to pass on the mystery uh, through his spiritual fatherhood. And that's integral to our regeneration. He says that for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you not have many fathers. In Jesus Christ, I have begotten you through the gospel. So you see here that that begotten, that passing on, that, that fatherly uh, 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 leadership is another expression of holy tradition and there's no salvation without that rebirth that regeneration through a spiritual father that's a, a a part of the holy tradition going on from generation to generation there's also uh he also commands us to be on guard to uh to protect against those who come in with a foreign tradition and to withdraw yourselves he says from every brother who walketh not according to the tradition which he received of us so so tradition is a is a part of the boundaries we talked about that we're going to see in the in the ecumenical councils, and it's a it's a way of, of delineating the boundaries. And those who do not walk according to tradition are outside of those boundaries. In Galatians, he says that he that we should not accept any other gospel. Uh, that even if an angel comes down from heaven, that we should not accept any other gospel. And that again is going to be passed on that gospel, that teaching, that experience through tradition through the passing on from father to son, uh, both orally and in, in writing. Uh, tradition is the experience of revelation and its transmission. Or another theologian in our day 
says that holy tradition is the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. So we have to kind of redefine, I think, that in the for most Protestants and most people in the West, the discussion is almost always had in the, in the paradigm of of Roman Catholic or Protestant, and so there's there's you know that's been hashed out for 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 centuries, and so when you approach the Orthodox Church, you need to think you have to remember that we're talking in similar ways, but maybe we mean different things with the words we're saying, and we have to repackage or re reinterpret things. Um, I I think one another way to understand holy tradition is, the, is that it is the truth and the way which leads to the life. Uh, and, or it, it's truth, way, and life, really. Christ is all three, right? He's all in all. So it's the passing on of the whole or the Catholic truth, that's what the term Catholic means, the whole truth of revelation. But not only that, not only that, but also the way or methodology which one can attain to glorification and salvation. So it's both the way and the truth. Uh, Holy Scripture is always a criterion for holy tradition. There'd never be a church father who would not teach and and Scripture would not be one of the criterion for, for holy tradition. And so Holy Scripture is constantly making references to the stages of purification, illumination, and glorification, if one has the right interpretive key. And all these spring from and lead to Pentecost. And so there's really no holy tradition outside the experience of Pentecost. Tradition without Pentecost is just superstition. So, so Pentecost is the context. In other words, the, the life of the spirit of the church going from generation to generation is the context of holy tradition. The essence of holy tradition is the transmission of the experience of Pentecost in every from generation to generation. That's the that's the point. Why does why does holy tradition or why does holy scripture exist? It's that. Each generation is initiated into Pentecost, into the into the experience of the life of the church. Um, so another way to understand is that that which is salvific, which contributes to the purification and illumination of the faithful, is holy tradition. Whatever does not lead to this end does not constitute holy tradition. So if, if there's somebody who says this is holy tradition, but it's not a part of the revelation, it doesn't lead to uh, this life in Christ, then it's not holy tradition. It might be a human tradition. It's neither here nor there, but it's not holy tradition. Holy tradition also uh, is the core of, uh, of holy tradition is the ascetic method. We talked about the methodology before that is both the way and the truth. Holy tradition is, an, is, is, is the ascetic method, the science of the spiritual life by which man is let out of delusion and enters into the, the life in, in God and participates in the divine nature. And finally, holy tradition is very is therapeutic. So, it's it means that from the apostles of the fathers to our saints of our day, it's passing on the di di diagnosis or diagnosis of the cure for our fallen condition. That's the heart of the tradition: salvation, curing ourselves from the sins and the passions. And so. If that which if if it's something that heals man, it's orthodox, it's holy tradition. It's that that which makes him ill is heresy. That that's that's how I would describe uh, in various ways holy tradition for the Orthodox Church. Now, if you want me to just jump into the second part, or you want to ask something more, I can give you some thoughts on what on that on that question of, you know, is there a is there a opposition? Do we have to choose between the two? Is there a hierarchy? We can also. Look yeah, I, I think it, it would be good to go there. I, I just wanted to comment. I had never heard, and I think it's very interesting, kind of that, uh, and I was actually listening to a podcast yesterday, and it was Orthodox that referenced this, but a, a soteriological imperative as relates to tradition, as far as the things that lead to salvation being a certain criteria for what is holy tradition and what is not. But I think it would be very interesting for people to hear you speak a little further on that second point as far as when there is this tension perhaps between either like what is holy tradition what is a tradition that is a tradition of men if you will or what seems to be a tension between tradition and scripture because i think 
you know, we see Paul laying out the idea, and I think it certainly plays out in the life of the church, that there is this possibility that new teachings come in that are not part of that deposit of, of the deposit of faith. And so what do we do in those instances and how do we know? And so, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. Yeah. Just a, a word about what you just said about the criteria, which I think is very important. When you, when you look in the scriptures, you'll see what Christ did for us. Everything he did from the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, everything in Christ's life to, to the last detail was for our salvation. He didn't have a need to do any of that for himself. Everything is for us and our salvation. That's the truth in the church as well. Everything that is of the church, in the church, for the, is for the salvation of mankind. If there are things going on in the church that are either opposed to that, obviously they're not a part of holy tradition, they're not of God, they're not Christ, or if they're just indifferent um, and they crept in because of various human traditions, they're not a part of the holy tradition and not a part of what Christ has done for us. I think it's very, very important to apply it to, if you see that in his life, you see that in the church as well. And that's very orthodox ecclesiology is so, is, is so closely tied to our Christology. So if you see it in the scriptures, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to be applied to the church as well, because we see the church as Christ himself. Uh, but to the question of, uh, you know, is, is, they're at odds. Is scripture and tradition at odds? And and I think that first of all, we have to say that it's erroneous to hold that there are two sources of of the faith, holy scripture and holy tradition. Uh, according to Orthodox teaching, there is simply the source of faith, uh, which is the revelation of God, which is expressed in uh, and through holy tradition and holy scripture. So. The, the revelation of God is the source of faith. And that is something that's obviously happened with the incarnation, but it doesn't stop with the ascension. It continues throughout the whole history of the church. And, and, and Christ is the continuation of the, the church is the continuation of the incarnation. And so um, this supposed dichotomy does not exist within an experience of Pentecost uh, as it's lived in the life of the church. There's no dichotomy in Pentecost, like tradition, scripture. On the day of Pentecost, there was no dichotomy between those two things. There was no even, it couldn't even possibly be there such a thing because scripture, as we said in the New Testament, wasn't even recorded as we understand it today. So there's no dichotomy. Uh, it's also very instructive when we uh, consider Acts 15. And it says, the first council, it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So that's very, very important for many reasons. We'll talk about that again when we talk about the councils. If, if we were to allow for the possibility of contradiction between the church and Holy Scripture, we would basically be implying a self-contradiction by the Holy Spirit. And that would be a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Obviously, there's no contradiction because the Holy Spirit is in both. So there's no contradiction, can never be a contradiction between Holy Scripture and Holy Tradition because they're both uh, expressions of revelation of the deposit that we talked about earlier. St. Vincent of Lorraine's gives us the famous uh, passage, which is very helpful. Uh, he says, when we find people alleging passages from the Holy Apostles or prophets against the Catholic faith, and he means here the one holy Catholic apostolic church, the faith of the church. In other words, they're openly alleging disagreement between the church and Holy Scripture. He says, without a doubt, we know that the enemy of salvation speaks through them. So there's they don't allow at, at all that kind of contradiction. That would be coming from uh, those outside the experience of, of glorification. Uh, so Whenever it appears that there's a contradiction, the problem is with us, not with Scripture or Holy Tradition. That's exactly what they were doing in the Holy Councils, right? That's what they were encountering. And that's the example of the fathers of the councils is that they had these challenges or these questions or these problems brought to the church saying, uh, you know, for instance, the Arians of the First Ecumenical Council said, supposedly, and marshalling scriptural passages saying that, there's no coessentiality between the Father and the Son. And so, obviously, there's 
a contradiction here supposedly between the tradition of the church, which said that he was divine, and scripture that they were marshalling. And the fathers showed how, in fact, they the problem was with the Arians. They were not interpreting scripture in the light of the experience of the church. How do we understand scripture? By the experience of the church. That's the only way you can understand scripture, because, again, scripture was given in and by and through the church. It's an expression of the life of the church, and it cannot contradict the the, the same spirit cannot be contradicted in uh, in in both of them. You know, contradicting himself through these two means of entering into the life of the church or the life of Christ. So the teaching of the church is actually the the true criterion for the proper interpretation of an understanding of holy scripture, um, and the church recognizes as the standard and the rule of interpretation of holy tradition uh, or the deposit which to which the scriptures belong, they form a part, those who have been glorified, those who have been uh, deified, those who have reached theosis, the prophets, the apostles, the fathers, uh, th those who have a, a, a chain, attained to glorification, not just a scholar or a thinker or, or anyone, but those who've, who've arrived uh, and, you know, there are many people who speak about things, but they have no knowledge of the way that leads to, to glorification. And so many of them don't even know the, ex the existence of glorification or that there is such a thing as theosis. So obviously it, there are presuppositions to uh, understanding Holy Scripture, and that's going to be this, that those who've arrived at that, who are like the apostles who wrote the Scriptures down, those are the ones who are going to lead us in interpreting scripture and it, and and because the, they're going to be living the life of those who wrote the same life in Christ that those who wrote the scriptures and so um you know the, it's it's impossible for us to embrace an idea that one can interpret holy scripture correctly if he has no idea of uh, or no participation in the revelation of the glory of Christ, he talks about in 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 John, where he talks about the glory uh, that he wants to see imparted to his apostles, and that they, that they may be one in him. Uh, without that that participation, we wouldn't presume to interpret Scripture. So we don't have a magisterium, but we don't have a pope. We have the saints. The saints are our authority, and we're going to talk about that, I think, next, if I'm not mistaken. And that's really uh, very very important uh, for the Orthodox. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. Thank you for that. And I think something that begins to come out in that response that I think, again, is maybe just one of those baseline presuppositions or just points where people talk past each other is kind of the, the difference between an Eastern and a Western approach to this, especially kind of in our post-enlightenment state in the West, where we have this ideal of the detached observer that is somehow the expert that it would make you know things better if you didn't have any skin in the game, where it seems to be, you know, flipping that a hundred percent on its head and saying actually those that we want to trust most with interpretation are those who have that lived experience that there's that emphasis on the the lived experience is that fair to say yes yes and i would say that this is this is the same rule that you're talking about is applied in the secular world all the time mm -hmm. people who are going to be able to speak about for instance we're going through this crisis with covid and all the rest you know nobody's going to listen to just anybody People who have experience, who have been initiated into the biologist is going to talk about biology. The uh, uh, the doctor is going to speak about uh, the things and he's, that he's living and experiencing. So it's presupposed that those who have experience are the ones, not just ones who study it, but have experienced the surgeon, not just anybody who studies surgery or, or reads a few books, but actually the one who's doing the surgery is the one who's going to tell us about and going to, going to confirm for us what is the what's the best way to do the surgery how it's done so i still think in the world they just don't apply it in the church they've made the church into a uh, they see it in a philosophical ideological sense and of course we reject all of that that's not uh, at all how we look about uh, things in the church uh, but in the world they still say that you have to have experience to speak authoritatively and that's all that the church has, has ever said is you know in the, with regards to its own its own teachings yeah, I think that's very helpful, and that's come out in a, a few interviews I've done and in conversations that I've been able to have with people like yourself who are Orthodox and have 
great like learning under their belt that have PhDs in this, but that will say in orthodoxy, that's not really the litmus test of, you know, being a good theologian. Not that it's an anti-intellectualism, but that that's not the mark par excellence of a theologian. Well, there, in fact, the academic theology, I would, as an academic theologian, I would say academic theology is a major problem in the church today. Not, doesn't, it can help. An academic theologian has, has a part to play. He can be very helpful. But the minute he becomes the rule and the standard that we just talked about, we've got a problem because academic theology per se is not one of the presuppositions for authority in the church. It's experience. And experience means uh, obedience, humility, prayer, fasting, ascetic life. That's the experience we mean in the Orthodox Church. We don't mean an experience uh, through book learning. That's not a, that's not a presupposition for authority in the Orthodox Church. So, when we when we see academic theologians, as, as you know, I studied Vatican II very very uh, for years, and they really were the authorities. In Vatican II, I mean, the bishops went in many ways to the academic theologians, and and I think that has also crept into orthodoxy in the 20th century. And it's not a it's not a good sign. It's not the orthodox way. Well, that that segues really nicely into where we're going next with a discussion on councils and authority, because as, as someone on the outside looking in and doing a lot of investigation into church history and into Catholicism and orthodoxy, authority seems to be this thing that just keeps coming up as far as, you know, there's so many questions to investigate, right? There's so many points of theology, but this really seems like a central thing. And in my investigation of Catholicism, this definitely seems to be central, and the papacy looms large there. It seems to be this thing of, hey, if the papacy is true, well, then it seems to follow that perhaps we should be Catholic or at least take that very seriously. However, orthodoxy isn't necessarily structured in the same way that it has this one figurehead that, hey, if, if this doctrine is true about, you know, this, say, you, you can't make it one-to-one, -one, like if the, uh, the ecumenical patriarch is true or, or whatever, then you need to be orthodox. Um, so so I, I feel like the, the idea of authority is a little less clear, though you've spoken into that. But when you're thinking of authority in the orthodox church, specifically ecclesiologically, what comes to mind and how does that work? So just like in the days of the apostles and the fathers in the early church, uh, we don't have one living authority. They didn't have one living authority then. It was very clear if anybody who examines early church history, there was not one living authority, uh, certainly not anything like papal infallibility. Uh, but we have many. We have many living authorities. And living authorities is the good, is, use that term, living Living authority means they have an experience of the resurrection and of the deification in Christ, the glorification of Christ. So we have saints in every age, and all of them together, from all ages, including our own, are our authority, the consensus patrum. Uh, and they're alive in Christ, both those who have gone before us, and the, the, those who live among us today are alive in Christ. So we have many saints today, and others who have just recently reposed, who have heard, who have seen with their eyes, who have looked upon uh, and with their hands have touched, uh, quoting uh, the Apostle John, uh, and from whom we not only receive, I've not only received, and many of us have not only received their blessings, but also their divinely revealed teachings and guidance. So authority in the Orthodox Church uh, rests in the saints, in the glorified, uh, who have never been and never will be absent from the life of the church. He says, the Lord promised, I will be with you until the end of the age. And that doesn't mean just uh, in terms of the Holy Spirit dwelling in the church or the Eucharist, that we believe is the body and blood of Christ, but in the lives of the saints. He's in, he, all these are little Christs. All the saints become little Christ. It becomes Christ by grace. And, they, and God speaks through them to every generation. So anyone who claims authority in the Orthodox Church must follow the saints. The, the, the phrase at the beginning of every Orthodox great council is following the Holy Fathers. That's how it begins. Bomenis tisayis patrasi. So it was, they were very conscious throughout church history that this council, if it's going to be legitimate, has to follow the saints that have come before us. And um, that means not just in word, but in deed. Uh, they follow the saints by imitating 
the saints because the saints image forth Christ. They've gone from the image to the likeness. You know, we were created in the image and likeness, but we fell away from both. The image was, was marred and the likeness was lost. In Christ, in baptism, we were restored. The image is restored, but the likeness cannot be imparted. It cannot be given and without our free will, without us wanting it. And that whole process of ascetic life in the church is going from the image to the likeness. Well, these saints, these authorities that the church recognizes in every generation, we can talk about how does the church recognize those authorities and why and what basis. That's a whole other discussion. But they live in the church. And so if you're not following in word and deed these authorities, you could be a bishop, a patriarch. You could be a whole council of bishops. If you're not following these authorities in word and deed and obviously in teaching, then you will be shown either quickly or over time to be a charlatan, to be uh, not a not a, a true shepherd and maybe even, God forbid, a forerunner of the Antichrist. Because, of course, the Antichrist is someone who sits in the place of Christ. It doesn't, not just, it doesn't just war against Christ, but he takes the place of Christ. And so a bishop who falls away from Christ but sits in the place that we say in Greek, the typos and the topos, right? He's in the, he's the type and the in the place of Christ. He, he's images forth Christ. Well, if he if he no longer is in deed and word following Christ and following the Holy Fathers, then he becomes somebody who actually is a in the place of Christ, right? He becomes an antichrist, somebody who, who obstructs us on the path to salvation. So, uh, but to give you a, a real life example, because there are there are many uh, in our 20th century, uh, I can speak to you of somebody who came to America, who was universally recognized today by spiritual authorities to be a holy father of one who images forth the holy fathers of, of old. Um, you know, we, we can, many of us can speak to you experientially of uh, this man who came to our very impoverished America uh, and was became essentially an equal to the apostles. That's a phrase that we use for those who, who do amazing uh, missionary work. And his, uh, his name was Elder Ephraim. He was a monk from Mount Athos, which is the monastic republic in, here in northern Greece. He came to America in the 1970s, and he just reposed last year in Arizona. <clears throat> he was an ascetic, uh, a man of continuous prayer. Uh, he was gifted with the discernment of spirits, one of the great gifts of the Spirit of God. He also had clairvoyance, so that meant that he knew things uh, which were impossible for human beings to know. Otherwise, God, in other words, enlightened him directly with both things that were going on at the time, but things that are going on in the future. And he worked many miracles uh, and people were going to be compiling his life uh, shortly. And you're going to see uh, witnesses to the miracles that God worked through this man are in probably the hundreds. Uh, when you met him, you got a sense of what the apostles would have been like if you had lived in the times of the apostles. Uh, his whole being was glorified, was sanctified. It wasn't just what he said. Uh, in fact, it was, wasn't was really what he said at all. It was how he sat, how he looked, how he walked, how he talked, how he looked at you. Uh, he, he, he actually exuded both physically and spiritually the aroma of sanctity. Uh, and, um, you know, he carried out an unprecedented work in church history. He started over 25 monasteries with hundreds and hundreds of monastics, uh, 18 of them in the United States and Canada, the rest in Greece. And he had probably at least a few thousand, if not maybe much more, uh, spiritual children who he counseled, he confessed, he, he guided uh, on the path of salvation. So, so when we talk about authority in the Orthodox Church, we, we don't talk theoretically about somebody in, in their position in the church. We don't talk about the past it's not just the saints who lived a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago. It's the people we know today who walk and talk and, and teach and preach and show forth the life of the apostles. Now, a word about the position of the Pope, because I think it's important to contrast and to see the difference between the Orthodox understanding. Um, and I'm not going to you know, say much, but just a few words. The, uh, the a life... Um, and the bishop who is who is not holy, is not purified, is not illumined, and is not on the path of glorification, 
uh, who's not orthodox in dogma and ethos, no matter how high the throne he sits on, it's not going to impart holiness. So my, what I want to say is that the apostolic seat, no matter how glorious it is, you know, how much authority has been invested in it from times of old because of those who've come before us, uh, it will not make automatically or magically anyone holy. Uh, and so that for us immediately means that without holiness, of course, in the Orthodox Church, there's no authority. Without sanctification, without glorification, without illumination, and those things shine forth in the life of the person, we can't talk about spiritual authority. That's why we could never accept the idea that a seat or a throne sanctifies someone and makes his teaching and preaching infallible or 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 something that the whole church should should listen to because he sits on that throne. That's just for us, it doesn't make any sense. We know what authority is in the church, and it's not the 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 role of the bishop, any bishop, or the role of the priest, any any role in the church depends. I mean, it has its authority in and of itself, but it, it's going to be uh, incarnate in that person. He's going to have to carry it out according to Christ to make that authority legitimate and, uh, and, 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 and the faithful, and the, 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 the uh, sheep to follow after the shepherd has to hear the, they have to hear the voice of Christ. So there's no automatic uh, sanctification. So throughout church history, many bishops have fallen away. In fact, most of the heretics of the ancient church were bishops, including patriarchs and some popes. Uh, so we have popes of Rome, like Hornarius and, uh, and, and uh, Virgil and others, who became heretics. They were anathematized by church councils. So uh, there is no automatic grace. There's no magical powers uh, in the church, even if one were, were to acquire all the titles and the accolades, uh, but if he doesn't rightly teach the word of truth, if he doesn't ascend the cross, uh, the, the, it, teaching the truth means that they've ascended the cross with Christ, which means we're talking about an ascetic life of denial, fasting, prayer, humility, obedience. In a word, they've crucified their mind and their desires. That's what that that's purification, which then allows Christ to speak through them, it, it, to be to make them illumined by the Spirit of God. Uh, so, uh, if they if if you don't pass through that, no matter if you're a bishop or a priest or anything, you will be like a heathen to the faithful, and Christ will say to you, "I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity." And so. It, this uh, it, 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 it's anybody who ascends authority in the church and assumes it without the corresponding life quickly or slowly, depending on what's happening in church history, will end up and has ended up throughout church history to be uh, expelled from the body and not not seen as an authority for the for the church. Well, that's really helpful. Thank you. And I think it's, again, just really insightful here, a difference between Orthodoxy and Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, whatever terms people want to use. I know people get uh, particular about that, and I understand why. But I think the idea that I hear a lot from my Roman Catholic friends of, you know, this split between infallibility and impeccability, really wanting to get this split between, hey, yes, like popes can be really, really bad in a lot of things, but still be infallible in their teaching. And that divide, it, it seems, from what you're saying, just seems totally foreign to the orthodox mindset of those things have to dovetail. We, we can't split them apart. Yeah, there's there's no way we could accept that as, as, a, um, as, as a rising from and being consistent with the whole life in Christ that we've been, we've been trying to describe here today. You, it's totally inconsistent. Um, God does, has not shown that he does that. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, bring about the, the uh, sanctification and salvation of the world uh, in, in that way. And, and the, in any case, they, they don't become authorities for us. Uh, it, we have to ascend the cross with Christ. We have to be crucified with him. We have to be purified of the passions. And then we can become conduits of the grace of God for other people. Yes, thank you so much. 
Father Peter, I want to make sure to respect your time. Are you okay to go on to councils here? Yeah. Or? Okay, yeah, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, no yeah. Well, I, I think this is a big question. And as I said here, it, it doesn't take long when investigating orthodoxy to start hearing about the seven ecumenical councils. It, it seems to just keep coming up as, at least as an outsider looking in, that, that this is really central to orthodoxy. But why is this so? Why are these councils so important? Well, first of all, I want to talk about the question of seven, because mm -hmm. unknown to many in the West, uh, but it's clearly witnessed to in our dogmatic monuments, our statements over the past, at least the last 500 years, uh, the Orthodox Church conscience uh, witnesses to nine ecumenical councils, including the, the that which took place under St. Photios the Great in 879, 880, including which, which had the papal legates, uh, present. Uh, it's called the Eighth Ecumenical Council, and it's commemorated in our uh, documents for the last 500 years by, and we could, the, you know, talk about those various documents. In fact, I will, in a, I think, uh, a little bit further on, but uh, the Eighth Ecumenical Council by St. Photius, and then under St. Gregory Palamas, or with St. Gregory Palamas as the main advocate for orthodoxy, we also have the Ninth Ecumenical Council in 1341 uh, to 1351. There's actually three councils, and they taken together as the Ninth Ecumenical Council. So these councils are extremely important for the Orthodox Church. Uh, they've been embraced throughout the Orthodox Church. There's no question of reception uh, not being received by the Orthodox Church. We actually celebrate St. Gregory Palamas on the second Sunday of Great Lent as the second Sunday of Orthodoxy, so to speak. Uh, uh, the first Sunday of Orthodoxy is the commemoration of the restoration of the icons, and so it's the the victory over the iconoclast uh, in the uh, in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and so the Church put him second, and 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 has embraced his theology uh, one hundred and fifty percent, and so there's no question that these are not accepted by the Orthodox conscious. Uh, we've, I think, out of inertia and also being rather affected by the narrative in the West, we've accepted uh, the idea that there's only seven ecumenical councils. But if you go to the actual documents of the church uh, councils from that time, again, councils that people don't know about in the West, they refer to these councils and they commemorate them. Um, so um, these councils are really important because they actually answer a lot. They go to the root problem of modernity especially the Ninth Ecumenical Council, St. Gregory Palamas. And he comes and he gives us answers to, at, the, at the base of, of the apostasy of, of, of the modern world and of the Western world with, after the Enlightenment. He really does give us answers to why did that, how did that trajectory end up happening? Why did we go that direction in the West mainly and uh, now throughout the world? Um, he answers also particular heretical teachings, for instance, uh, the Filioque, which is considered a heresy, of course, by the Orthodox, created grace, which I said earlier, we don't accept. Uh, and then the device of papal pretensions and, and presumptions and, and much more. Those are dealt with in those councils. So, But to answer your question, the ecumenical councils are important for us today because they were important for all Christians throughout the history of the church. Um, they were manifestations of the infallible voice of the Holy Spirit, uh, they were proclamations of the truth of the gospel in every age, countering the heresies that, that were challenging the gospel, uh, meaning the theanthropic nature of the person of Christ in most cases. That, that was the issue again and again. It's Christ. He is the stumbling block. He's the sign that will be spoken against, uh, according to the prophecy of the, um, uh, the uh, prophet uh, in the temple, Simeon. And the... We also have the, 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 in the councils, we have the demarcations of the boundaries of salvation. That's the terms used in the Ecumenical Council for their decisions were the term ori, oros, uh, that means boundary. So what the fathers were doing in those councils was laying down the boundaries of salvation, outside of which you will not make progress in the process of pure perfection. You will, you will be outside of the truth of the gospel. Uh, so the the councils uh, can, are the continuation of the of of Pentecost of the unifying work of the Holy Spirit that began on Pentecost, and they're calling all men to that unity in Christ 
that was that that was achieved or given uh, in on Pentecost, which was of course the overturning of Babylon. It was the overturning of the disintegration of unity uh, when man, in his arrogance, uh, tried to ascend without God to become like God, just like the lie of the devil in the garden. So that work of Pentecost, which is salvation of the world, is is uh, reaffirmed and proclaimed and and guarded throughout the uh, ecumenical councils and decision of the council. So the council defended the faith once delivered to the saints uh, against the distortions of the various heresies. The I would call the heresies philosophizing rationalists. That's what a, her a heretic becomes a heretic because he walks the path of a rationalist. In other words, he uses his rational intellect to peer into the things of God in which no man can walk and understand with the rational intellect. And so he falls away from the experience, which is above the, the rational, the super rational with his, with his spiritual uh, intellect, his, his noose uh, or, or the spirit of man. So th those who teach and preach and walk according to a heretical way and, and do not proclaim the truth are those who have uh, fallen away from themselves. They've fallen away from their own uh, the, uh, calling and makeup, uh, and they've 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 turned upside down the order of their own self, but also the order of God. And they try to use the rational intellect to achieve uh, spiritual knowledge, and that's that's why they they fall away. So in do in doing this, the ecumenical councils uh, exposing the rationalists and 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 setting the boundaries. They continue the work of evangelism. Uh, they they preach the gospel and call all to unity. And, uh, of course, the unity cannot be based on anything but the spirit of truth. Uh, you can't have unity outside of truth, and truth and uh, unity are inseparable. And so the, the councils uh, from the first council in, in the Acts uh, up until the, the very last council that will happen before the second coming, uh, if it's a true council of the church, this is the work uh, of the church to proclaim Christ, his theanthrop theanthrop theanthropic nature, uh, which will be that which will be denied at the end times by the Antichrist. That's the key doctrine which will be challenged in, our, in, in the days of the Antichrist will be the theanthropic nature of Christ, that he is both God and man. And that's continually what the church is teaching and preaching and defending against. And so that's why the councils are so are so important. Well, thank you for that. And thanks for the clarification as well on nine versus seven ecumenical councils. That, that was helpful for me. And I had heard of those latter two, but I just, I didn't realize it would be proper to lump them in. So thank you. I, I, I've learned many things well, today, but that is certainly among them. There are some Orthodox who will say that's not official, but anybody, I mean, all the contemporary authorities that I know and anybody who's living the life of the church sees these councils commemorated and, and celebrated. So I really don't think there's any, any debate among the Orthodox. Well, that leads me into a question that I have struggled a bit with, and that is, what makes an ecumenical council an ecumenical council? Because it, it seems to me, and granted, I, I'm new to looking into this all, so very much so, but there, there are certain councils like the Robber Synod or there is the uh, Council of Florence that th they seem to have maybe some like external markers of they're, they're attended, they, they happen, but, but they're not listed under you know, the, the seven or nine ecumenical councils. So what, what is it that makes an ecumenical council an ecumenical council? So there's two ways we could answer that. We can talk about some external presuppositions, and I'll, I'll give you those. Uh, but those are not the key. Uh, the key are going to be the spiritual presuppositions. Uh, but I do want to say that absolutely there are councils which in many ways fulfilled the externals, and they were rejected by the church. Uh, one of the most notable was the Council of Hiria, uh, which was an iconoclast council called not long before the Seventh Ecumenical Council, uh, or actually the restoration and the restoration of, Orthodox, uh, of orthodoxy. Uh, but it was a, a huge council, and it was it was really a, a, attended by hundreds of bishops at the time. So you can get a sense of the degree to which iconoclasm really ravaged the church. Uh, if you're not familiar with iconoclasm, this was the hundred or so years from the uh, uh, 
eighth and ninth century, 700s to early 800s, where the emperors, uh, the Roman emperors uh, uh, in Constantinople were imposing a, uh, a policy of destroying the icons that had been obviously accepted and painted throughout the whole empire and goes back to the earliest times of the church. And they had said that these are, uh, these need to be rejected. And the church struggled through its great teachers like St. Theodore the Studite and St. John of Damascus and others, and many martyrs and confessors against this idea saying that actually the, it, the, the depiction of Christ and the apostles is a, a glorification, a proclamation uh, of the incarnation. And it's uh, essential uh, that we, we do this uh, to proclaim and to confess the incarnation. So that council was massive. And if you had lived at the time or, or and, and many other times uh, throughout church history, you would say, well, maybe, maybe that's the faith. If you didn't have the presuppositions to understand what the faith is, or you would have maybe given up and said, well, everything is lost. Uh, but that's not the case. Uh, uh, numbers are not a criteria. Uh, in fact, the second ecumenical council was quite small. It was not even called as an ecumenical council. Uh, the the uh, papal legates were not in, in, in uh, sent or even uh, present because it was a local council of Constantinople, but it was accepted later by the consciences of the church. And here's one of the keys that you're looking for is that over time, the consciousness of the church, uh, it, meaning the whole of the faithful, monks, priests, lay people, uh, embrace the teaching as a proclamation of the gospel. Uh, so that's a key. You can have a council for a time appear to be accepted because the officials or the highest officials because of political pressure accept it. But if the faithful and the especially the monastic aspect of the church, which has always been the guardians of, of orthodoxy, if they reject it, then uh, it, it'll eventually fall away. That's what happened with the Council of Lyon, which was a, a union council in the 13th century, or the council, and they were martyrs on Mount Athos that refused to accept it. They were martyred by those who were in favor of the uh, uh, of the false council of Lyon or the council of Florence that you said is also rejected. Uh, so the question is, well, there's no, there's no hard, fast, like legal external criteria that's going to tell us which is which. No, there isn't. There really isn't. Uh, it's the faith and it's the confessors and it's the saints and it's the faithful as a whole uh, who are going to point to the truth. And of course, that's, that's the way it's always been. It's not really something that happened just post, uh, you know, the second millennium, as it was the case, the case in the first millennium as well. If you study church history, you'll see that, for instance, right now in the Orthodox Church, we have a lot of chaos because we have uh, a split between two major patriarchates. It's not a uh, not a pleasant experience. But if you look at church history, you'll see these things all the time. They go on again and again and again throughout church history. So. On the one hand, it's very sad and it's terrible. On the other hand, it's not surprising because what's at stake today are very serious dogmatic and uh, ecclesiastical issues. And so the church is going to go through a process of struggling uh, to overcome that. And it's going to be in the saints of our day who are going to point us in the right direction. And, and there have been many, as I said, many false counsels. So it, it is, uh, it's key that the one of the keys to the to the to the council is going to be that in in the council there are glorified and illumined men of God. So you will not see a church council that's been accepted uh, by the faithful without those kind of figures present. So you go to the first ecumenical council, you have massive saints, you know, just towering figures of the church who were who were uh, coming out of the persecution, like Saint Nicholas of Myra. Uh, Saint Spiridon, uh, uh, Saint Athanasius the Great. These are towering spiritual figures. They were present there, and they spoke through their experience and gave the truth. And 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 the, the heresy of Arius, who denied the divinity of Christ, was overcome. And so that's one of the presuppositions that you will have illumined and glorified men of God at the council, and then it will be received by the whole body, the whole pleroma the whole pleader of the fullness of the church over time. So it's actually not the hierarchs who have the last say in the Orthodox Church. It's the faithful. And it's the faithful who are going to be, who have 
as simple sheep like the apostles themselves who were simple, right? They followed after Christ. In every age, it's the same thing going on. And again, the gospel is not just for then. It's repeated again and again and again throughout history. So there were Pharisees who rejected Christ, few that accepted him. Most of the simple people embraced Christ. And throughout church history, that's what happens in terms of church councils. Now, if you wanted a more legal, quick definition of what's an ecumenical council according to externals, I can tell you that all of the ecumenical councils that we commemorate, the seven or the nine, rather, um, the, they were convened by an emperor of the Roman Empire, because, of course, the Orthodox do not accept the idea that the Roman Empire fell in the fourth century, but it's from Constantine in the fourth century all the way to the fall of Constantinople. That's the Roman Empire. There is no Byzantine Empire for the Orthodox. We never called it a Byzantine Empire. It's a, it's a technical term by historians much, much later. They themselves called themselves Romans. The, the, the invading Turks called the people in Constantinople Romans. They, everybody understood that this was the Roman Empire that was falling in the 15th century. So throughout that whole time, the councils that were called were called by the emperor. Um, they had a, a pan-Roman range, in other words, and even outside of the Roman Empire, there were people who were coming. Uh, the rulings were accepted, as I said, by the entire church throughout the uh, world and throughout history to this day. They had a, a formulated by a divinely inspired father, as I said. They, uh, they were uh, accepted by the Roman patriarchates, uh, uh, which would have been the, the, uh, the patriarchate of Rome in the city of Rome until the, until the uh, schism. And then they dealt with serious theological issues. Ecumenical councils were not called for things that were not of pressing dogmatic uh, you know, uh, dogmatic meaning for the church. Uh, you wouldn't, they, you just don't see that in church history. An ecumenical council became that because what it was talking about was the truth and the dogmas of the church. So that's one, another six, five, six criteria that you can say, well, what's an ecumenical council in church history? That's it. You might say, well, can you call an ecumenical council today? I think you can. Uh, it hasn't really been done since uh, the 15th century, 14th century, in terms of its, I mean, councils have been called and they've been called ecumenical when they were called, but they've not, the, the councils that have happened, and I'll we can talk about that, there's been many, uh, they've not received the same status as those that we call ecumenical, the nine of but they have the same impact on the life of the church. Interesting, yeah. and, and that is helpful, and that is exactly where I wanted to go next, and that you know, again, as an outsider looking in at Catholicism and Orthodoxy, I, I hear like these pitches for, oh, like with the magisterium, we have this living authority that can continue on and can speak to these modern issues. But then there's also this sense of it. There's a certain liability to the papacy of you're kind of at the whim of what is the Pope going to say something and how do we make sense of that? And I see a lot of Catholics struggling with kind of just some things that Pope Francis has said, not that we need to get into that. But so there's that, that benefit and drawback on that side. But then one, one thing that I find with orthodoxy is you have the beauty of the fact that it, you know, it, it seems unshakable might be too strong, but there's a sense in which that the faith isn't rapidly changing. And I remember talking to Father Josiah Trenum about one thing that was really big for him was that he knew his children would be practicing the same faith as him. And, and that was really important. Mm. But I also hear the criticism of, hey, but but what can orthodoxy say about today's issues if there hasn't been an ecumenical council and say whether you go off of like over a thousand years or several hundred years can can there be a council is that a liability that there haven't been more ecumenical councils how how does the church function um in light of that so the church uh wouldn't call a council just to have a council so there's going to be a real challenge to, as I said, to the dogma or the doctrine or the teaching of the church. And that's going to be considered an ecumenical council of an import. Um, the church exists in uh, localities. It's a, it's a, it's in a particular time and place and that's where you live. And, and as long as the, as long as the life of the church is not challenged, uh, you know, on a, on a mass scale, you're not going to see a need for an ecumenical council. It's not, it's not the end all be all of orthodoxy. Uh, but the good, the, the news is that many people don't know is that there have been actually quite a few councils in, in the second millennium. I've talked about the Ninth Ecumenical Council, 
But we also have the Council of Constantinople in 1285, which <clears throat> rejected the filioque and, 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 and dogmatized as it pertains to the procession of the Holy Spirit and rejected the Council of Leon, which was a false council according to the Orthodox. Um, then you also have the Synod of Constantinople in 1484, which was called as an ecumenical council, said that they were an ecumenical council, uh, and that is to condemn the Council of Florence. That was in Constantinople in 1484. And that's where you have the decision to be made, how we, we receive those who are coming over from the Latins to the Orthodox Church. They call themselves ecumenical. It was a very large number of bishops. Uh, it hasn't been commemorated as ecumenical by the rest of the church since that time, but it essentially did the work of an ecumenical council. You have the Synod of Jerusalem in 1583, and that was concerning various um, Latin teachings, Roman Catholic teachings. They rejected filioque, they rejected unleavened bread, they rejected the purgatory. Um, they rejected the idea that the Pope is the head of the church and not Jesus Christ. And they rejected the Gregorian calendar and especially the Pascalian, which was the change in the date of Pascha. So that's a very important synod, 1583. And then you have councils in Romania, very important council in 1642, a council in Jerusalem, uh, which deals with uh, Lutheran teachings, actually, uh, that were uh, condemned, Cal Calvinist, I should say, teachings that were condemned in the person of Ciro Luc Lucaris. Uh, some say that he never actually pr professed that, but in any case, that council was called to condemn Calvinist teachings, and that's considered a pan-Orthodox council, really not much different than ecumenical. Maybe they're not calling it, I don't know the, the sources historically, but one reason they might not call it ecumenical is because, as I said earlier, the ecumenical councils were considered those called by the Roman emperor, and, but in function, it's just like an ecumenical council is accepted in by the church and all the bishops. In the Council of Constantinople in 1755, very important council concerning the reception of those who are coming over from Catholicism to Orthodoxy, and they decreed that they be baptized because the uh, after the Council of Trent, they had abandoned, for all intents and purposes, the practice of full immersion, and they had adopted aspersion or pouring, and the fathers at that council considered it to be a a diversion which cannot be, uh, you know, economized, we would say, in the Orthodox Church. That was in 1755. We have a 1772 council that can, again, condemns purgatory as a non-Orthodox teaching. And then you have 1819 council called to endorse the teachings of monks on Mount Athos, the so-called Kolivadis fathers, who were very important fathers, St. Nicodemus the Hagarite and others, my point here is that the church, the life of the church has continued, and there are many councils, uh, as many and many more that are not commemorated here. So I don't think that it's an argument that, well, the Pope called, I mean, there are, we hear this argument, but the Pope called many councils in the second millennium, the Orthodox don't have any ecumenical councils. It's not really true. And the, um, the question is, can, why would we consider the Pope's councils to be ecumenical when he essentially is not, uh, you know, he's, he's no longer a part of the Orthodox Church. He's no longer in communion with all these bishops in the, in the ancient church that these councils happened. So I, I think it's kind of a diversion from more deeper issues um, that we need to talk about. But I, I think the church's life continues, and it's very dynamic. And we may see uh, in the not-too-distant future uh, a, a major council called because we have many serious uh, dogmatic issues that are, are are at stake today. Yeah, well, thank you. And that was really helpful for me as someone who, you know, engages in these conversations between Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox. And that is definitely a criticism you hear a lot. And it was helpful to hear about these councils that, while perhaps not given the title ecumenical council, essentially do the work of an ecumenical council and allow the church to continue addressing issues mm -hmm. as they come up and, um, yeah, that, that was just really helpful. And thank you so much for this entire interview. This has been such a joy and a privilege to do. There has been so much in this. I imagine this will be one that people will have to pause and go back and listen again and, and listen several times because this was fantastic. People probably want to grab a, a pen and paper to uh, make sure they've got all these thoughts 
and track. But thank you so much, Father Peter. I want to just close out by allowing you to uh, share any final thoughts if you'd like, and also just let people know where they can find you if they want to learn more. Well, I guess my final thoughts would be that the the Orthodox Church today has a great, great task ahead of itself, in, in, especially in the Western world. There's a lot of work to be done to bring all of this treasure of, of, of dogmatic and spiritual uh, uh, monuments uh, that are commemorated and lived out in the Orthodox Church to bear on the illnesses of, of society, uh, to enlighten the root of the problems. Because I think one of the things that when I converted, to, I was actually an Anglican, grew up an Anglican, my father was an Anglican priest, but then I, I spent about a year and a half, two years as a catechumen in Catholicism. And so one of the things that I had difficulty in becoming Orthodox was I was very much an activist Christian. I was uh, pro-life. I was going in front of abortion clinics. I was getting, I had actually gotten arrested a number of times with the uh, Operation Rescue back in the early 1990s. And so my, at that time, my idea of Christianity was not hesychastic. It was not, uh, you know, I did had no idea of the church history and all the rest. And so I said, well, how, how is Orthodoxy dealing with contemporary issues or issues in the church on a, on a social level. And I, when I stepped back and I started to consider things more deeply, I realized that Orthodox Christianity, the church, uh, gives uh, essentially, we have, if we can consider it, the body of society uh, like filled with cancer, like the cancer of disbelief, of atheism, of, of apostasy from Christ. How do we solve that sickness? I think the Orthodox Church comes and says we have the, we have healing in the Orthodox Church. That whole body can be healed and regenerated. I felt like the activism that I was doing at the time, I can't speak for other people, but what I was doing, I was putting Band-Aids. I was in an emergency room. I had a lot of intense encounter with serious, you know, day-to-day -day problems, but I didn't know how to solve the deeper issues. And I think the Orthodox Church has much to bring to those, the root of the problems of, of, of the revol revolution of, of modernity. And it can become a lighthouse. It can become a focal point of unity for many. Uh, and and the, uh, you know, the, the, the battle of Christians against the various uh, isms of our day, you know, that, that, are, that are destroying society, that has to be uh, done in a deep, deep spiritual way. And it has to be solved in a very deep spiritual way. And it has to be based in the long ascetic tradition of the church and I think the Orthodox Church is called to bring that to bear. So I hope that um, that will be the case. And I think that it will be very enriching for many people if, if the church can continue to do that. And, of course, that will be done through the saints, through the, through the, through the holy people, uh, those who have been purified, illumined. Those are the ones who are going to be able to do that. Um, we can't remain as talking heads. We can't remain as ideologues. This is not the church. We can't just talk a good game and we've got to live it. And, um, and, and because we're in it, we're in the days, I think in many ways, we're in the days of, uh, of the last days, many signs of the last days. And the, when we see the rise of, uh, uh, of, of man replacing the God man, that's, that's a sign of the times and only the full philanthropic therapeutic method of the church can, can solve people's uh, deeper problems. So anyway, that's a few words of thoughts for conclusion. Thank you so much for having me. I hope it was uh, not too much. It seemed like a lot, but uh, it, these are very weighty subjects. So it was it's, it's difficult to present them in a few, few moments. Well, thank you so much for doing so. And I greatly enjoyed it. I know the people that watch this, whenever they watch it, will enjoy it as well. I'll be leaving links to uh, your YouTube channel and some of your other work in yeah. the description so people can check that out. But I just want to say a final thank you to everyone who watches this whenever it is that you're watching this. I do not take your time lightly. And I thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. And as always, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world.